100 years after the end of World War I, there is another war, one of world visions. The ideology said the French and U.S. presidents clash as leaders gather in Paris for commemorative events. How dangerous are these differences and how close are we to another global conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. It was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. It became a pivotal moment in world history. It marked the armistice agreement that officially ended World War I. And this weekend, 100 years later, leaders from more than 50 countries are gathering in France for commemorative events. But the solemn occasion is being overshadowed by deep divisions between transatlantic allies. This week, the French president called for a European army to defend itself from potential threats from nations such as Russia, China, and remarkably, the United States. Emmanuel Macron's global philosophy is at odds with U.S. President Donald Trump's nationalist America First agenda. How stark are the divisions between those ideologies of Trump and Macron? There's a lot to discuss with our guests. First, though, Rosalind Jordan on how the U.S. got involved in the First World War. On April 2nd, 1917, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson issued the battle cry, the world must be made safe for democracy. Many Americans approved of the decision to go to war against Germany and its allies, a government that is running amok. But despite the headlines and propaganda efforts, just as many Americans opposed fighting in the so-called Great War. The U.S. historian Michael Kazin described the anti-war movement in his recent book, war against war. It didn't seem like a war that was in the American national interest. Uh, it seemed like a war that most Europeans uh, had not wanted to fight in the first place. So uh, there was a sense that if America got involved in the war, it would only make the United States a more militarist country, uh, which is just the fault they saw in the European powers that had gone to war in the first place. Even so, Kazin says the impact of the war on U.S. society was far-reaching. Some suffragists leveraged women's performance in the workplace to convince Congress they should have the right to vote. Black soldiers, including the Harlem Hellfighters who fought in France, discovered their service did not protect them from racism after the war, and that inspired the work of civil rights activists in the decades ahead. And the U.S. started a long-running debate about what it means to be a global power, economically, militarily, and diplomatically. Wilson had resisted calls to enter the war since it began in 1914. But after a German U-boat torpedoed the cargo ship Aztec on April 1st, getting Congress to declare war was easy. By the time the armistice was signed on November 11, 1918, 116,000 U.S. troops had died, either in combat or because of the flu pandemic. Kazin says that does not mean the anti-war movement had failed. What the story of the anti-war movement during uh, World War I can teach us is that um, it's crucial for Americans, for people of any nation, to um, force their politicians uh, and their media um, and their businesses, those who run their businesses, to uh, think very carefully about this decision. Because once you decide to go to war, um, there's no going back. An important insight 100 years on, especially given that Americans still don't agree on when and why the U.S. should go to war. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, Washington. Joining us now from Coventry via Skype, David Lees. He is lecturer in French studies at Warwick University and co-editor of Contemporary France and in Berlin. Thorsten Benner, director of the Global Public Policy Institute. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. We appreciate it. So there's been a, a lot of lead up to the, this commemoration, these anniversary events in Paris. And over the past few days, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron made a, a call for a Euro European force to defend Europe, specifically naming um, Russia, China, and the U.S. So I want to start with you, David. How did those remarks strike you? Well, in many ways, I think this is this is nothing new in, in some ways for Macron. He he's positioning himself as a kind of strong, dominant leader of the, the French nation. 
And of course, Russia is perceived to be a threat by many European powers, including Germany and the UK. But the difference here, of course, is the, the mention of the USA as being a potential challenge. Now, this comes in the context of Donald Trump threatening to withdraw US funding for NATO. And Macron is a real, he's a real fan of the, the so-called supranational bodies, so particularly the European Union and also NATO. And he sees the French role in both of those organisations being significant. So for Macron, in some ways, this is an opportunity to position himself as being a leader of those two organisations and to see France as being pushed to the world stage. I think he's really sort of jostling for position here. And in many ways, I think we need to draw a line between the, the rhetoric of Macron and the realities of the situation. Macron and Trump appear to enjoy a, a very close personal relationship, whereby here in the rhetoric around what Macron is saying, this appears to be sort of more of a challenge and a position of trying to force France to the top of the, the international agenda. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into this. Um, are, are Europeans even on, on the same page with Macron when it comes to that, David? And I'll get to you in just a moment, Thorsten. I wouldn't say so, no. I think Macron, is, is, he has his own political agenda to, to try and meet, of course. This is a man who is uh, actually very unpopular at the moment domestically in France. He's somebody who needs to try and boost his own uh, popularity in, in France. And he's concerned, I think, in particular about his domestic economic agenda. His, he came to power promising economic reforms to the French state. None of these have been seen yet. And so really there are people in France wondering what exactly Macron is going to do. Now, whenever a French president looks to try and uh, position himself as a, as a kind of key leader overseas, this is usually a sign that their popularity is in some way challenged. So Macron is sort of deflecting away from his lack of popularity at home. When you look at other UK leaders, Angela Merkel, for example, uh, and Theresa May in the UK, there's clearly a sense that actually a European Defence Agency or a European Army is, is not going to happen. It's not something which is a priority. And in particular, of course, with the UK's context of Brexit, uh, that's clearly not a, a number one priority at the moment. So Macron, in some ways, is, is an outlier, really, in that. And I, as I say, it's a really, a, a really issue around rhetoric and around Macron's own political domestic agenda as anything else. Thorsten, how did it strike you when uh, Macron spoke that way? I mean, the, the context seemed pretty reasonable. Uh, it was a speech or remarks he gave uh, leading up to the anniversary of the end of the First World War, where he warned uh, against the poison of aggressive nationalism that is spreading in Europe again and across the world. He warned against the aggressive authoritarianism of China and, and Russia and against the division that Europe, uh, the internal division that Europe, divisions that Europe needs to overcome. Those are all very reasonable remarks. Uh, what he said with this kind of real European army that he wanted and also this offhand remark that it's partly p possibly also directed uh, against the US that struck me as somewhat odd. I mean, it's, it's partly in tradition with uh, some, of the, uh, some of the previous rhetoric, but it overshoots the previous rhetoric, I think, quite considerably. And I'm not sure why Macron chose that. It wasn't embedded in a broader policy initiative. It hasn't been, there hasn't been any follow-up. The US and France are allies. Does it concern you that this is what the rhetoric has become between two countries that are supposed to be allies? David, I'll let you take that first. I do think as well, it's kind of um, Macron positioning himself as appearing to be in this kind of long tradition of anti-Americanism in France. This is something which goes back to the, to the 1920s and beyond. And more recently, after the Second World War, there was a, a significant level of anti-Americanism, which was, of course, encouraged by Charles de Gaulle. Now, Macron sees himself as being a Gaullist in some way, seeing as it kind of directly inherited some of Charles de Gaulle's policies, some of Charles de Gaulle's ideas around France's role on the world stage. So I'd say in some ways what Macron's doing here is kind of aping de Gaulle's language, but in a context where there is no more Cold War. It's a very different political and economic landscape from the 1960s when de Gaulle was in power. Okay, so we want to bring someone else into the conversation now. Um, from Brussels, Teresa Fallon is going to join the conversation, Director of Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. We appreciate your time, and I want to bring you into the conversation and ask you the same question that I put to um, the gentleman that um, in the last few days, um, Francis, Francis President Manuel Macron, pardon me, um, made reference to wanting a, a European force to defend Europe, specifically a, against threats. He named Russia, China. That's not surprising, but he named the United States as well. I'd be curious to know your thoughts, your reaction to those remarks. 
Well, we saw Donald Tusk say the same thing several months ago. I think this is a worrying narrative, especially since transatlantic relations have been very strong for the last 70 years, and this is not helpful. I think this is in response to the Trump administration, uh, JCPOA, the pulling out of the Iran agreement, also climate change pulling out of that agreement, and also the tariff war. So instead of working with the Europeans, uh, the Trump administration has unfortunately had the approach of upsetting everyone at the same time, allies as well as adversaries. And instead of working together with them, they've actually turned them against the U.S. Now, this new program that uh, Macron has uh, mentioned, I mean, I wonder how this will work sitting as I do in, in Brussels, how this will work with PESCO, because PESCO is made up of 25 members. And this is kind of a coalition of the willing. It also pulls in the U.K., uh, which is traditionally not interested in some sort of a European army. So this is an interesting creation of uh, a coalition of the willing. And how this will affect NATO, will it help or will it compete with NATO in the future is, uh, is also problematic. Um, I think everyone would be happy if Europe did more heavy lifting. Uh, the U.S. is involved in three theaters right now. And if Europe did more heavy lifting in its own region, I think that would be very much appreciated. Um, Thorsten, I want to uh, bring, bring up something. To, uh, Theresa made a good point that she said that there, maybe it is a fair critique that Europe could do more of the heavy lifting. And some would say that that's what Donald Trump has been trying to get to. Um, it's just maybe not perhaps the most diplomatic way that he says things. And let's just be honest, he's actually insulted a lot of allies but um, and said things that just weren't factually true about, you know, they owe the U.S. money, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, do you think he has a fair critique? Of course. I mean, he does have a point. Uh, Europeans are not doing their share to collective security within uh, NATO and uh, European allies or everybody agreed to a 2% spending goal uh, in terms of GDP. Uh, and uh, many countries, including Germany, are not moving closer toward that goal, at least not fast enough. And uh, so to many Americans, including Donald Trump, uh, European allies come across as needy, whiny allies and free riders. Uh, and uh, he articulates this in a pretty crass kind of way. But I think he does have an underlying point that Europe needs to shape up and needs to invest in its own capabilities in order to be a credible ally that the U.S. also takes seriously and also to prepare for the eventuality that uh, the U.S. will call it quits and no longer underwrite an unconditional security guarantee for Europe, which is not a, a very improbable uh, constellation in the coming decade. U.S. President Donald Trump is a self-identified nationalists. He specifically used that word a few weeks ago in a rally. He, he embraced it. He said, yeah, go ahead and call me that. Um, what might that mean going forward? What do you see that potentially meaning? Well, I think there's a very real risk of isolationism, isn't there? I think um, it's, it's clear in terms of the, the rhetoric around Trump and most recently, of course, in the midterm election campaign, uh, that Trump sees himself, as you say, not only as a nationalist, but as a kind of, in the French term, closed nationalist, as to say, you know, closing the borders, uh, protecting the, the, the nation state against sort of foreign influence. I think the real risk, of course, is that the US withdraws, uh, as we've been saying, from, from Europe uh, and withdraws some of those old strategic alliances, um, particularly when it comes to helping Western European countries uh, with their defence. The real risk, I think, is that this, this heightens the tension between, or perceived tension between the likes of Trump and Macron uh, as they try and sort of appear to be the, the dominant powers in, on the world stage. The real, the, there's also serious concerns around uh, the future of the European Union, of course, and the, the future of some of the major powers in, in Europe. Angela Merkel's term will come to an end shortly. Uh, Macron is trying to become the lead figure in, in the European Union, but it comes at a time where governments in Italy and elsewhere are uh, postulating around the idea of removing their own nation states from the European Union. So the kind of real, the real risk this might take would go back to the, the package you ran at the start of the program around uh, US isolationism just before the First World War and indeed before the Second World War, where the risk is that the kind of, you know, the rise of a populist government perhaps in, in Western Europe or elsewhere, you know, potentially Russia, might lead to some kind of potential conflict. So that's a real risk. And I think everyone, you know, all, all powers really should try and try and avoid that. And, Mostly, you know, uh, France, Germany, Western Europe will absolutely want to avoid a situation whereby their their, their future security might be placed at risk. Uh, Teresa, what about that? There have been a lot of um, 
you, some, some would say populist, some would say nationalist, some would just say flat out far right leaders that are gaining hold, that are taking ground in, in a lot of places, some European countries, um, some in, in South America. What is the state um, of liberal democracies right now? I think they're under threat and things are going to get worse before they get better as I expect the global economy to be slowing down. In Europe, we see great concerns with Hungary and Poland. So it's interesting that this EDU that Macron has put together did not include Poland, which is a major uh, player in Eastern Europe. And so we see kind of a paradox with uh, Macron because he talks about multilateralism, but at the same time, he's kind of fracturing the EU because there is PESCO, this organized group within the EU. And by just working with this coalition of the willing, uh, of carved out of some EU member states, the only Central Eastern European or uh, part of that region is Estonia. So he kind of kept Poland out largely because of uh, the, the, the current government. Now we've seen an interesting development there with the Polish president when he visited the United States. He discussed having a Camp Trump. And this kind of speaks to a much larger issue that Poland doesn't feel that other European member states would come to protect them if there should be any sort of invasion from Russia. So the fact that a European member state is turning to the U.S., not NATO, but to the U.S. for Camp Trump uh, speaks largely to you know, lack of faith in the Europeans coming to their rescue or to protect them. Thorsten, um, you mentioned this a, a little bit ago about um, Angela Merkel soon will not be <laughs> on the international stage anymore. Um, what does that mean for Europe? I mean, uh, first of all, I think the broader context is that Germany has been dealing with its own internal political turmoil for the past year. It has been a lost year for Germany's role in Europe and Germany's role in, in the world. Chancellor Merkel is weakened uh, as a result. Uh, once she departs the stage, whether that's next year the year thereafter, uh, a new leader will be there. The, the real question is whether we have a, a functioning coalition government that has a clear agenda to engage at the international stage. That can be done without uh, Angela Merkel. Of course, her experience uh, at, the, at the global stage will be lacking, but there'll be a new German chancellor and he or she will be able to kind of slowly, uh, you know, fit, fill, fill, the, fill the shoes. But the broader issue is whether there'll be increasing volatility and instability in the, in the German domestic political situation. And that would greatly curtail Germany's ability to play a constructive role in Europe and beyond. Okay. Um, David, um, obviously the Brexit actually happening, being approved, is, is obviously was indicative of some issues that were bubbling up um, in the EU. But now that it is, it is happening, um, what do you think it is indicative of in the future? What role is that playing in the shifting and changing dynamics in the EU? Well, I think, I mean, firstly, obviously, the, the UK will draw from the European Union. Uh, so that will change, to some extent, the nature of the, of the group. And not hugely, because as we've been hearing, the UK uh, traditionally doesn't like being involved in too many initiatives uh, in Europe. But I think the real the real risk is the, the knock-on effect Brexit might have. Uh, if Brexit is perceived to be a success, and that's very much in doubt at the moment, then the there are some, some parties, some political parties on the extreme right in particular across Europe who will look to try and draw on examples of Brexit and potentially remove their, you know, if they're successful electorally, to remove their nation states from, from the European Union. So there's a Front National in France, of course, with, led by Marine Le Pen at the moment, currently called the Rassemblement National. This party is, has always tried to withdraw France at least from the Eurozone and potentially future, in future years from the European Union. In, in Italy, we have the, you know, the, the Northern League of the League uh, in, in power. We've already talked about Germany, the, the rise of the, the alternative the Deutschland movement. There's a real risk of these populist parties seek to use an example from Brexit and try and try and introduce some kind of referendum or at least some vote, some meaningful vote on their on their on their, their, their nation state's role in Europe. I, I, I would suggest really this depends largely on whether or not Brexit is, a, is an economic and political success. That's not not a given at any by any means at the moment. And it looks as though really the nation, the, the kind of the nature of the UK's relationship with Europe after Brexit will really depend on whether those populist parties in France, Italy, Germany, elsewhere seek to try and draw on those examples. But at the moment, I'd say, you know, currently, especially with Macron's leadership, 
the future of the EU is relatively stable. It just depends really on how things emerge over the next few years with the UK. Teresa, how um, does, and if, so, if the answer is yes, how, how does Russia benefit from all of the, um, the, the turmoil? I, I hope that's not too harsh of a word, but all the uncertainty with what's happening with so many countries in Europe right now and, and the relationship between Europe and the U.S. Does Russia benefit from that? I mean, this is Russia's long-term interest. They don't like the EU and they don't like NATO. So seeing a fracturing, as we've seen uh, across Europe, uh, it's far easier to play EU member states off each other now. Uh, NATO has really helped keep the peace for all these decades. And I think it's, it's a shame it shouldn't be underwritten or uh, if, if this group can work together with NATO, I think it would be a very positive thing. But fragmentation is always dangerous. Uh, the question is, is this you know, old wine in new bottles? I mean, how much funding? That's always the key question. Where's the money coming from? And will it replicate what's going on at NATO? We, no one wants that. Uh, so Russia and China, we should speak about both of them together mm -hmm. because in the national security strategy of the US, they put both of them into the same basket. And I think traditionally Europeans tend to see China as kind of far away, nothing that we really have to worry about. But we've seen recent uh, exercises with Russia uh, from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean two years ago and last summer uh, in the Baltic Sea. So I think this is kind of showing Europeans that, you know, Russia and China are here together performing these uh, exercises and that it's harder to kind of write China off as being farther away. Also, China's first overseas base was opened in Djibouti, which is right here in Europeans' neighborhood. So I think Europeans have to think of a larger geopolitical landscape. Uh, traditionally, Europe European Union says they don't do geopolitics, but I don't think they have that luxury any longer. The world is changing. The world is shifting. That's why we're having this conversation. It is a completely different world now, obviously, than it was 100 years ago. Everything is different. But could you ever see a scenario where there could be another world conflict, a world war? Of course. I mean, we should never rule this out. Uh, and Teresa mentioned the uh, heating up uh, of rhetoric between uh, China and uh, the U.S. Uh, if there's a war between China and the U.S., this will have, shed, you know, very far-reaching, very, very extremely serious consequences. So, of course, uh, we stumbled into World War One. That's the that's the histor history lesson. A lot of individuals didn't expect it. We got the peace wrong. Uh, that's what we're celebrating: 100 years of armistice and 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 peace. Uh, and uh, we then stumbled again or like into and allowed World War II to happen. So I think, yes, uh, we have a resurgence of nationalism and uh, that's breeding ground for future conflicts. So we can't rule it out. David, I want you to, to respond to that real quickly as well. Well, I think, I think we, we tend to rely on, on uh, people behind these, these figures, don't we? So we rely on somebody uh, with a kind of sense of, uh, I guess, calm behind someone like Donald Trump or behind someone like Emmanuel Macron. And I kind of, I hope, you know, for as long as, as we've been able to maintain peace in Europe uh, since the Second World War, we've been able to rely on, on diplomacy to work in some way. And, I, and I'd like to think that regardless of how heated the rhetoric gets, we will be able to avoid, you know, kind of a, a war in the same way as the kind of, you know, the traditional First World War, Second World War, an armed conflict which involves hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people. Uh, what is the risk, I think, now is, is more likely a kind of technological war involving some kind of cyber warfare. I think that's the real, the real risk with the, the China and, and U.S. conflict. Okay. And Teresa? I don't see any easy solutions. There were many challenges ahead, but I think we all need to work together and with one voice that should prevent and hopefully uh, continue the peace. And we should remember all this on November 11. Absolutely. It's a perfect final word. Thank you all for the conversation. Appreciate it very much. Teresa Fallon, David Lees, and Thorsten Finner. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime. If you visit our website, go to aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.